Hey, everybody, before we get started with this interview, I just want to give a heads up. Um, there's uh, some adult language in here, but more probably importantly, um, if you have a history of trauma or abuse and if that might trigger you, um, you might want to skip this episode. Um, uh, my guest does share some sort of graphic uh, uh, details regarding uh, some experiences that that occurred in his life when he was younger. Um, so I just wanted to give you a, a heads up on that. Um, so if you want to, uh, you may want to skip this episode um, or listen it with earbuds if you are around your kids. Um, all right. For everyone else, enjoy. And I completely blacked out. I ended up leaving like my body and stuff. And I just remember feeling just really, really sad um, because I didn't want to die that young. And I felt like I had so much more life left. ADHD Rewired, episode 156. This is the show designed for those of us with really good intentions, but a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and speaker. The website is ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me tell you about this. I joined the group because I don't think I've ever been able to finish things. I've gotten more done in the last 10 weeks. I've made so much more progress than I've ever been able to do, and I can see success this time. If you've been thinking about joining our spring coaching and accountability groups, and you're waiting to pay full price, hey, thanks. But if you miss early registration and you prefer to get $400 off our spring sessions, you can. If you go today, February 22nd, or next Tuesday, February 28th, go to coachingrewired.com to reserve your spots. Registration is by appointment only, and I only have a few spots on these two days. So don't wait to schedule your call. Go to coachingrewired.com. Spring sessions start April 24th. More details are at the website. That's coachingrewired.com. I really did have a pivotal change in my perspective. It's kind of mind blowing, but it has been a really amazing experience. That's coachingrewired.com. Just a quick reminder, you can still purchase the Encore package for the 2017 ADHD Women's Palooza. Get access to all 36 sessions, plus downloadable bonuses from all the speakers. It's just 197 bucks. Go to erictivers.com slash palooza. That's erictivers.com slash P-A-L-O-O-Z-A. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Eric Light. Eric was diagnosed with ADHD as a child, but says that he didn't take the disorder seriously until very recently. It has played a big impact in his life, and now he's trying to figure out what he wants to be in his life. Eric, welcome to ADHD Rewired. Hello. Hello. All right. So you reached out to me. I think it was over. Just you sent me an email uh, um, just saying that you'd be interested in potentially sharing your story. Yeah, for sure. So let's let's start there. What is so you're you're how old? I'm 22 right now. OK, so tell us your story. You were diagnosed as a kid. Yeah, yeah. No, I was diagnosed uh, probably around uh, maybe I was like 10 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't really know what was going on. I, I just know that my like dad was giving me medication. <laughs> so, um, here, take this kid. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, basically. And I just noticed it gave me at the time, like a lot of stomach aches and stuff like that. Um, and so I ended up just kind of stopped taking it because, um, I didn't like how it was making me get stomach aches and, and stuff like that. Um, eventually I revisited it, um, early high school and, it was working at first. And then, uh, the, uh, pediatrician I was seeing, they kept raising the dose and then it just kept getting 
more intense where I would be like really impulsive and would do things that I necessarily didn't want to do and then would regret after. And then, so I kind of got freaked out by it. And then I just started uh, kind of believing the, all the myths about it and like how it's like fake and like all the drugs are bad and all this stuff. And I kind of uh, just lived without medication and that and not really paying attention to ADHD most of uh, for about like four or five years or so. And then everything kind of just went downhill and now I am taking medication and stuff and like paying attention to it, I guess. And okay, so there's a bunch of years in between there. So yeah, you had, yeah, yeah. so so you started. Uh, you were you said you were diagnosed around ten. Um, you started taking medication. Um, it wasn't making you feel good. Your parents brought you back to the doctor, um, and they just sort of up, continued to up the dose, and it was making you feel worse and worse, both physically and sort of behaviorally yeah yeah and what so what were you telling do you remember what you were telling your 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 dad about that i just remember i would like hide the pills and stuff and not take them because they made me feel like sick and stuff and um how long were you doing that for i don't remember it was like a long time uh quite a while i don't remember okay. exactly but i think what happened is the doctor okay. probably thought I was taking them. It's like, oh, this isn't working, so I'll raise it. And then when I actually did take it, it was like, like intense. So that could have happened. So was there like was was there like a big stash of like Ritalin like on your bed somewhere? <laughs> just like I think I just like threw it under the couch or something. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, you didn't have any pets that were. Uh... <laughs> uh, no, everything ended up fine. So yeah. Okay, so um, well, what was um, what was high school like for you? High school, um, like I said, I think like early high school, I, I took medication for a while, and it was it was helping for a bit. Um, as the uh, doses dosage got raised, though, um, I would do things. I would like volunteer for things and stuff that I wasn't necessarily comfortable comfortable with. Like I took like a lead role in this huge play, and I was like freaking out. I'm just like, why did I choose to do this? And yeah, so that was bad. It's like it's like not taking small steps towards what you want to do, but taking a giant, like huge step and it just like the anxiety is unbearable. Like what did I just do? Kind of thing. So it goes it goes from the thought of, oh, maybe I'd be interested in, in trying out theater. So let me try out for the starring role where it's gonna be all consuming for me. Well, it wasn't even really a thought. It's just like, okay, I'll do this. <laughs> like, and just going for it. <laughs> and then like, what did I just do? <laughs> so there, so there, there was, there was a, a lack of thought. It was just like, how did I get here? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, kind of. And then, and then I ended up uh, just like smoking weed and stuff like that instead as, as a self-medication, which actually did help. When did you start that? Um, I started that like grade 10. So okay. I'd probably like 16, 17, something like that. Okay. And when, let me ask you this, when you, because uh, I find these sort of the profiles of people with ADHD and uh, their, um, like how they, hate, they tend to smoke um, pot, uh, there's some interesting profiles that I've seen from some of the research. Did you, like, well, also, are you more the inattentive or combined hyperactive? It's, I have no idea. What, what flavor of ADHD do you got? You don't uh, know? I have no idea. No, I don't know. I mean, maybe we could figure that out for you uh, before the end of the end of this interview. Okay. Um, did you like when you started? Did you like go gung ho? Or you like first time you get high, and then the second time was the following day? I was actually like um, kind of, I guess, sort of responsible with it in the sense that I'm like, I am only going to smoke one joint a week, and that like I would even like spread it out among the days. Like I'm like, that's the limit per week, and that, that's what I, that's what I went with. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you said that you were you said that you were self medicating. What, yeah. what um what you mean you said that it helped a little bit with with social. Well, yeah, with social stuff it helped uh, a lot. Kind of just um there was it took away a lot of the anxiety and a lot of caring about what I would say to people or anything. It kind of just made it go smoothly, if that makes sense, I guess. So it did help definitely with socially. It didn't help academically at all. <laughs> um, but yeah. Do you think that it that part of the the area where it helped socially was that now you had friends to smoke with? Yeah, that's and probably so part kind of it. Of bond there. Yeah, that's probably part of it for sure. 
Yeah, I, I know I've, I've uh, um, I know of a lot of people who, you know, they part of why they really uh, you know, sort of buy into the whole sort of uh, pot culture is because there is a an immediate sort of connection uh, there with with people, and uh, for for a lot of people with ADHD, you know, friends weren't always something that was plentiful. So now you found this very accepting sort of group of people, um, and the, but then if you take a, take the weed away, you find that there's not that actually much in, in common with these people. Yeah, no, that's true. Like when I stopped smoking weed, uh, a lot of the friends I had just went away because that was kind of like what made us friends was we'd get high together and stuff like that. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that can be hard, especially when you're like in high school and stuff. Um, cause you want to be, um, have friends and, and stuff like that. So it, it can be difficult for sure. Okay. So was there a particular, so it sounds like you're not smoking now. No. Okay. Is there like a particular reason that you stopped? Um, the reason I stopped is because, um, I ended up doing, uh, mushrooms and I had a really bad trip and ended up developing a panic disorder mm. and I would get panic attacks like 10 times a day. And, um, ever since then, uh, it, it just tends to exaggerate my anxiety. Um, like even like a week after, if I just smoked it a week out for a week, I'll have like bad anxiety. Um, so I kind of just, that's kind of the main reason I stopped it. Okay. So you're having a lot of anxiety, a lot of panic attacks, uh, uh from this, um, what else? So you weren't taking medication then at the time. Um, no. You were struggling in school. So at this point, you were in high school or college? Uh, I was in high school then. Oh, you were still in high school. Okay. And then yeah. did you did you go to college right after high school? Uh, I took a year off and then I went to college for a year and then I took three years off and now I'm back in college. Okay. So what did you do on that first, uh, your, your first um, sort of gap year, if you want to call it that? Uh, the first year, I kind of just like made youtube videos and stuff and um what kind of youtube videos uh just like comedy videos and vlogs and stuff like that just random stuff any particular topic or is it just like really random not, not really a particular topic it was just kind of random <laughs> <laughs> whatever whatever was on eric's mind yeah pretty, yeah. pretty well <laughs> okay all right um are you still doing that oh uh, yeah yeah for sure okay cool okay so then you went back to um you went back to school and then what? When I was in college. Mm -hmm. So you took the year off. You took a year off. Yep. After high school. Yeah. Then you went to college for, you said for one year? For one year. Yeah. Okay. Um, how was that year? Probably not. I didn't probably do the best I, that I could with it. Um, probably because I wasn't medicated or anything, but um, I did like smoke weed a bit throughout college and that and went to different parties and stuff and bunch of other crazy things happened um yeah i don't know okay yeah um what 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 did you find to be the hardest for you when you uh your your first year in college the hardest um just dealing with a lot of um uh i guess like personal stuff um having a lot of anger issues frustration um just a lot of internal stuff that i was dealing with at the time was probably the say, biggest thing. The anger issues, like ang angry at, at other people, angry at situations, angry at yourself. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I wanted things to go a certain way or something. And when they wouldn't, I'd get really frustrated and angry. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. There was just a lot of um, pretty bad stuff that happened there. But um, Do you want to talk about any of that? Um, it just, uh, had a pretty bad, um, relationship stuff going on at the time. Um, wasn't excelling enough in YouTube and stuff like that, that I wanted to at the time. And it, it had a lot to do with, I think, validation mm -hmm. and, um, thinking like people will like me if I'm this popular, or this happens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I had, it kind of went to my head because I had a lot of fans and a lot of people that meet me, like would notice me in public and stuff. And they would say like, like there was like these girls that were crying when they see me and like all this stuff. And you're like a beetle, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, so in, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, I'm sure that probably felt amazing. Yeah, no, for sure. 
Um, I was always very isolated and alone growing up and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, having people actually like, like me or something was, I don't know, something I wanted, I guess. Was it almost like a drug in some ways where you're like, this feels so good. I want more of it. Yeah, that yeah. for sure. That kind of caused problems in my relationship and stuff. But yeah. how so? I mean, my ex at the time, she uh, felt like I cared more about my YouTube videos and stuff than her, which was probably true at the time. And um, uh, just crazy stuff happened there. We got into a lot of fights and stuff. But how long? How long did it take you to be able to admit that, even to yourself? To admit what particularly? To, to admit that um, you probably did care more about your YouTube videos than her. I knew it at the time even, but uh, I don't know. I just, I didn't really know what to do about everything. I just knew I had issues or something. Um, I needed probably therapy or something, but I didn't know what exactly was going on or anything. Okay. So. And, uh, and were, you were in therapy? Not at the time, no. Okay. I actually just stopped. I was in therapy before I moved to go to college and I kind of just stopped it halfway through and just went to college. Okay. Um, so you, you weren't in any therapy during college? No. Okay. I know there, there's other, um, so you had this, this girlfriend that sounds like it didn't work out. Um, you said when you were younger, sort of just relationships were just hard for you in general. Um, yeah. What about rela- like family relationships? Um, I have a hard time with that as well, for sure. Um, I'm not like super close with my family. Okay. So do you want to talk anymore about that? Um, I'm like trying to be more closer to like my dad or like my mom and stuff, but even there, there is not, it's a working progress, I guess with the other parts of my family. I basically don't talk to them really. Okay. Um, now I know that uh in before uh before the we, this interview um you know when, when you were talking you were sharing uh, a bit about your your backstory um and there was a uh, sort of an element of uh that that you shared uh with me um uh, that was pretty scary from when you were when you're quite young um would you mind sharing just a little bit about that Yeah um when I was I believe around 4 to 6 years old um my mom ended up divorcing my dad when I was like four years old. And so I ended up going to uh, this babysitter that ended up abusing me uh, pretty badly and uh, definitely had an imprint on the rest of my life. So how do you think that's affected you now? And again, I'm, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. It's, it's, I know it's hard to talk about. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's affected me in particular, I think in relationships with women and stuff. And, um, also just in self-esteem and stuff like that, probably, um, there's probably other ways I'm just not even aware of. Um, but, um, I think that'd be what I am aware of, I guess. Okay. And, um, have you, uh, in, in therapy, have you worked on issues related to this? Um, it's, I brought it up in therapy a few times. Um, I mean, I did do like, I guess it was like trauma therapy or something mm-hmm. where you like, they hypnotize you or something. So like EMDR? Like I, I guess I'm not sure exactly. Okay. Um, but uh, that was kind of a, a weird experience. Um, I don't know. They kept on like telling me how like, oh, it couldn't have been that bad because it was a woman and stuff like that. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so, um, so if, if there's any, you know, clinicians listening to this they like i'm sure there's outrage that just like the the the, the therapist in me is just like that's i mean to think of it, you're basically blaming the victim doing that it's to think that it, it's almost like saying because someone gets aroused when they are sexually abused that they must have liked it like what our body yeah. how our body responds and what our brain tells us isn't right like are two very different things and it's very I think, confusing for for a especially for a child um who who is abused and and it's so confusing to think about like oh you know it was it was a woman so it must have been okay no that's like that's air comes that's really bad advice that you got <laughs> i think their idea was like um because it was a woman they're not capable of um having complete i guess lack of empathy or something maybe or i'm not too sure but uh 
don't know. It's just really, it's really fucked up. So, yeah, no, it, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's in, in mental health, you know, it's, it's, we know how important it is to, to find someone who really specializes in these different areas. Um, and I know it could be hard to find someone who both specializes and really understands ADHD and understands trauma and abuse. Um, so it, it may be worthwhile to explore both of those issues, um, uh, whether together or, or separately. Um, but I think if you, if you talk to another therapist and they tell you it wasn't that bad because she was a woman, oh, that is, that's, um, that is not good advice. Well, I've had like multiple different therapists and stuff and, um, most of them are good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I've even seen that even in the general public. Um, I don't know. There's just like this taboo that because it's a woman abusing some guy or something, it's like this weird taboo I find. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and that happens to be, that happens to be one of the most underreported, uh, um, uh, types of sexual abuse, um, out there. I mean, it is because, because very much because of what you just said, because of there's this like, oh, you know, it's the guy should feel lucky that this happens. Like, no, it's, it's, it's not okay. I should, I should mention, I, it wasn't sexual abuse I went through though. Okay. Um, it was uh, physical abuse. Um, okay. And just weird, it's important like detail. mind messing stuff. Um, in particular, um, one of the things that, that, like when I try to remember this stuff, it's like in, in bits and pieces, like in pictures and stuff, it's hard to, to recall everything exactly. But um, from what I do remember, like it was kind of like she would isolate me Um, she would, uh, like lock me in a garage or something. Um, and, uh, it was the whole idea was that I was being punished because, uh, I like stole a toy from her or something. And so I deserved it or something. So when I was a kid, I thought I was just being punished because I like did something wrong. And, um, there was one, uh, there was one time, uh, I ended up, I just got like fed up with it all. And I just like told her like, no, or whatever. And so she grabbed a dinner plate and like shoved it right against my neck towards the wall. And I remember feeling like the front of my neck touched the back of my neck from the inside. And I completely blacked out. Um, I ended up leaving like my body and stuff. And I just remember feeling just really, really sad um, because I didn't want to die that young. And I felt like I had so much more life left. Uh. And then, um, I ended up snapping out of it and I was like frozen. Like I couldn't move or anything. And I was just like staring at her and she looked like she was scared. Like she just killed me or something. And I just basically just stared at her. And then I don't remember anything after that. Just goes blank from there. Um, there was other times she would only feed me, uh, this like oatmeal that have some type of drug in it or something. And I would end up throwing up on myself and stuff every time I would eat it. And um, she would make me eat my throw up and stuff off the uh, pavement floor um, and and stuff like that. Um, And if I didn't eat all of it, whatever, she'd put it in the freezer to like freeze it like an ice cube and then put that in for the next day. So this is a sick woman. Yeah, really fucking. uh, She was like like, like psychotic or oh something. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And yeah, it's just, I would hallucinate and stuff a lot too. Um, when I was there, I'm not sure why exactly if it was cause of the trauma or it was some type of the drug that she was putting in or something. I'm not too sure. But, uh, I mean, there, there was a time I remember I was like laying on a the couch there and I was like really bored and this TV just pops out of nowhere in front of me. And I'm like watching this TV and it, it was like playing something I wasn't interested in though. And I was like, Oh, I wish I could change the channel. <laughs> this is like an hallucination. So I can't. So oh my gosh. yeah. Um, there was another time, uh, she put me, uh, behind a couch in between like a wall. So there's like that space in between. I had to like lay there for like eight or 10 hours or something. Cause my dad used to work long shifts and I'd get so bored. I'd like chew my fingernails off and play with my fingernails and stuff. Or I would, I sometimes would hear the TV and I would kind of like play what was going on the TV in my head. 
there was other times like she'd put me in a corner and I'd have to stand there for like 10 hours. And I would just like look at the patterns in the wallpaper and they'd start moving around and stuff. And I would just like count them continuously for like ever. So, so let me ask you this. Um, you know, we, we, we know that sometimes um, ADHD symptoms, uh, um, that, that kids who are traumatized um, can uh, present with ADHD like symptoms, you know, uh, you know, daydreaming, um, you know, which is understandable in a, in a, in a, in a, in an attempt to sort of escape the, the awful reality of what's, what's going on. Um, you know, and, and then even just lashing out, um, or impulsivity because it's like when what's happening, how can you, how, how can a child make sense of what doesn't seem to make sense? A, a adult who is supposed to be protecting you, um, is is harming you in such profound ways has when you went and uh you said you were diagnosed in fifth grade um right uh, something around there i don't remember did they explore that and try to, try to weed that out uh no one knew about the abuse until i was like 15 16 years old you held on to that for that long yeah i didn't I wasn't even like, I was weird because I kept on like, I was like, Oh, maybe it was abuse or something. And then I kind of go back and forth on it thinking that it was just, they were strict or something or, I don't know, it was really weird. I don't know why that was, but, um, it took a while to kind of process that it was actually like abuse. Um, cause I remember even talking to my one counselor and like, even the fact that she would lock me in a garage would be considered abuse with like the tools and that and stuff wasn't really safe for like a kid even. So, um, but no, it was just really messed up. And, um, yeah. So no, they didn't like know about that at the time. Did, um, did you ever, uh, guys ever press charges? Um, because of the amount of time that passed and stuff, um, it was reported eventually. Um, when I was in counseling, they ended up reporting it. I think what ended up happening is she would, they, cause there's like certain laws and like, you can't watch certain amount of kids and stuff. Cause she used to have like a ton of kids she would watch and she would actually abuse the other ones I heard, I found out after. Um, and so I think now she can only watch a very limited amount. So I guess there's less kids abuse, but even today she's probably still abusing kids for sure. I wouldn't be surprised. And do you, do you know that, that, that what happened was not your fault? Of course. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. You know, that's, that's heavy. And, um, um, you know, I think that any time that any of us deal with, with, with trauma, um, it's, you know, it doesn't, it's going to, to impact our sort of worldview and our psyche, but it doesn't need to have a huge detrimental effect, but we have to work on it. We have to really explore how this impacted us. Um, something I want to mention too, um, to people listening stuff is, um, like this lady was seen by like my town as a really good babysitter. Like people would like recommend her. She was like highly recommended. Um, so like, you know, little did people know she was like doing that behind the scenes, but, um, like she was highly recommended, uh, from people and stuff. Cause she's like, Oh, look at all the kids she watches and like all this stuff. And she had kids of her own too. And they would help me when she was gone. But when she was around, they would be mean as well. Um, there, like she would, there was a time like she wouldn't let me go to the washroom and stuff. And I had to go to the washroom really bad. And then she ended up leaving the room or something. And then one of the daughters like, like grabbed me and we like ran upstairs. And I was able to like go to the bathroom and then run back down. Um, oh God, it's, 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 it's horrific. It's horrific. To say that they, they, you um, probably did not have a normal childhood as a result from that would probably be an understatement. Uh, yeah, probably not. Yeah. Um, what, what's the story that you tell yourself about this now? Like, how, how do you make sense of it? The way I view it is um, it's, it's just something that ended up happening. I, I can't really control the past necessarily. Um, and I, I kind of... I always like thought I was different than other people and stuff. And I was like, and then I thought, you know what? It, it's completely normal for me to be unnormal because of the situation. So like, like most people don't necessarily go for something like that. So like, you know, I guess I'm normal based on the circumstances. If that makes sense. I don't yeah, know. it does make sense. It does make sense. Yeah. Now you said when you were, um, so it, 
when you went when you went back to college, you were in counseling and you restarted medication, right? Yeah, no, recently um, I ended up getting into uh, counseling because I really found I needed help um, because uh, about a year ago or so, um, I was just like working at a dollar store and stuff. I was not happy with the way my life was going. Um, and so I ended up just quitting my job and flying to Florida and I lived it there for like a month and then I came back. And was there any planning involved in this uh, quitting job and going to Florida? It was just like, uh, I wanted to go on an adventure or something. It was sort <laughs> of like a, like what you make the decision and go in like a week. Like how, how did that all happen? Well, I felt like I'm like, I'm not happy now. I can't just keep doing this. So let's just do something. And okay. that was like the step to kind of do something. Wow. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what brought you to, uh, cause I know when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that, um, you finally got back on medication and it was the medication that really helped you, um, yep. like deal with a lot of the, the trauma. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was, I was in counseling off the medication for a while and then, um, I was applying for college and stuff and I had like an IEP in high school and that. So I had to get all this documentation, uh, to, to show that I could get accommodations in college and stuff. And I ended up basically going to my doctor and that, and then, did kind of like this test for ADHD. It was kind of like a written thing. Mm -hmm. and I, I remember I was doing it. And I was like laughing because it was like one of those things where it's like sometimes, often, very often. I was like very often, very often. <laughs> and it was like, and I was like, okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna try like a really like the lowest dose you can try and see how it goes. And it was like night or day difference, like how much it helped um, in a lot of aspects of my life. And in one of those was, uh, with, with counseling and that, because most, like most of the time doing counseling without ADHD medication, I would just constantly like zone out and not really absorb the information and like kind of just, I don't know, it just wasn't getting in. And with, with the medication, I was able to actually put things into, into practice. I still had to like, during even this, the sessions and stuff had to like write notes and stuff to memorize it all. But, um, definitely was, um, helpful. Another thing is, uh, I went to it weekly instead of like biweekly because normally it was, uh, biweekly, but I needed it every single week. So I did that as well. But uh, a combination of that and just reading different self-help books and stuff and implementing different things, um, tended to help a lot. So would you say you seek out a lot of self-help kind of, uh, material and books and stuff like that? Well, yeah, yeah. Especially when I was dealing with stuff, I wanted to figure out what else, what, like what are the options I can do and stuff. Um, but uh, I wanted, wanted to mention like uh, like three things that seemed to help me the most out of anything. And uh, one of them was uh, exposure therapy, um, but not just for like anxiety and stuff, but also like emotionally, um, allowing myself to open open up more to people slowly and stuff. And then things like that um, definitely helped like majorly. Um, was like even like exposing myself to things I felt uncomfortable with or something um, really helped. If you know what I'd like to do, because I think that um, I, I want to really focus on these th the three things that you want to talk about and really uh, dive into a little bit what exposure therapy is about, because I think it's really important and it's a very effective uh, a treatment approach for, for a number of things. Um, but what I want to do first is take a quick break. And uh, when uh, and then when we come back, we will dive into, uh, into those uh, three things. Okay? All right. We will be right back. In March 2017, ADHD Rewired celebrates three years of podcasting. Can you believe I haven't missed a week? From the podcast to the coaching group, specifically to the 174 members who have been a part of one of 16 coaching groups over eight seasons, I just want to say thank you for growing with me. If you want to grow beyond the podcast, on the podcast, you hear a lot of great ideas and you get to connect on the listening end with people. If you want to go beyond that and you have a desire to connect with people who share your same struggles, 
and you want to put those great ideas in place in a way where you're going to have the most success, then sign up for the coaching group because it'll totally change your life. It'll move you forward and it's absolutely worth it. Come grow with us this spring. Go to coachingrewired.com and let me know you want to get your ADHD rewired. That's coachingrewired.com. Do you have a question about productivity or ADHD that you'd like me to answer? Do you have a topic you want to talk to me about? Join us every second Tuesday of the month at 12.30 p.m. Central Time for an hour of live Q&A. To register, go to erictibbers.com slash events. You can ask me questions live on video or enter it in the Q&A box during the event or submit your questions ahead of time. Your questions may be heard on an upcoming episode. To confirm dates and times and to register, go to erictibbers.com slash events. See you there. All right. We are back. Are we just making funny faces before we were? <laughs> <laughs> you're just trying to throw me off the concentration here, which is really easy to do. If, if uh, it was the episode 150, uh, I think three with Kim Kensington, um, we had, it took I think four or five tries to get through the intro. I just kept laughing, um, but I just I decided to leave all that in uh, for for YouTube because um, it was kind of funny. Even going back and editing editing all of that, I was like, oh gosh. Um, so that's that's all there. All right, we are oh, before the break. We were talking about uh, you said there's three things that were really helpful for you. Um, one of them had to do with exposure therapy, and I wanted to uh, to kind of dive in a little bit more to sort of what that is so listeners uh, um, sort of understand what that is and and if you can talk a little bit about how that was, uh, um, how you used uh, exposure therapy. Yeah, for sure. Um, Exposure therapy is kind of the idea that you slowly expose yourself to like your fears or different things that you're not super good at, I guess. And I guess what it does is you slowly get better and better at it, I guess, as you keep practicing or something. And I found like for things like that, um, if you, you can't really just dive into it because it's too overwhelming and then you end up getting more overwhelmed about it. So kind of doing a a slow approach and thinking of small things. So like, if you have like social anxiety, just like talking to someone on like a cash register or something or like different things like that and, or talking to someone on the phone or, you know, uh, just, slowly exposing yourself um tends to like help to me at least a lot so um yeah i mean and, and, and really what that is it's a, it really is sort of a rewiring of the brain because what what happens for people who have uh, um uh, anxiety based disorders is um our brain sort of ha- is sending these signals to us that there's an actual danger uh, that we're approaching. So we can feel highly anxious, flooded with all kinds of stress hormones. Um, and so what happens is we avoid those situations and then our brain sort of learns that, oh, this must be important because you're responding to this and now I'm feeling better. So I'm going to keep sending you these signals, right? But except the problem is you're getting the same kind of signals that um, are helpful if you're like walking through the woods and suddenly you see a bear. Like those signals are are helpful during those those situations when you have to pick up the phone to make a call or you have to go to the store and you have to interact with people. Like those aren't helpful sort of signals to, to be getting. So the idea is it's 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 a form of desensitization um, to... To uh, to whatever that the the triggering sort of event is, um, and so a, a doing it with a therapist, you would sort of start with what I call the low hanging fruit, sort of the easier stuff, like not not going right to like the, the you know top fear, um, you know, and it's 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 a hard treatment approach. It's a hard therapy as a, as a, from a, on the client end. Um, cause it is, it's really hard work. It's you're intentionally exposing yourself to situations that are going to increase your anxiety intentionally. Once you do it, it feels so good that you actually did it yeah. and that, and you feel a lot better about it. Um, which actually, I don't know if this is related or not, but something I've noticed recently is, um, when I try to get myself to do something like exercise or like work out or like go for a walk or something, um, I constantly have to remind myself how I feel after. So like, it's good when I'm like, 
like was like, oh, I really don't want to like go for a walk right now. But I'm like, every time I do though, it helps exactly what I'm not upset about right now. Eric, it's such an important, and I want all the listeners and viewers to really sort of take note of that because that's that's one of the things that I encourage so many of my clients to do, and I do myself. You know, so often when we put our those sort of reminders to ourselves, whether it's on our to-do list or in our in our calendar, we put the what, but we need the why included in that what so instead of just saying okay remember to take a walk like add to the, the whatever your reminder sort of system is you know take a walk i feel so good afterwards and i probably will not want to do it at the time so like add all of that information to sort of that that cue so it's it's triggering more to that that the emotional center of your brain not just the sort of that cool dry you know uh, the what center of the brain because uh, you know it's like wow man, I walk why would i want to do that <laughs> right, when, well, when the cue comes i want to add something to that too actually yeah. um i i believe like as, as humans uh we've developed to not want to use up calories of energy and so when you, when your, your mind's like, why would you go for a walk? That's completely pointless. There's no food at the end. There's no, there's no benefit really. So then if you, if you can use your mind to tell, tell itself that there actually is a benefit that you'll feel better and it's going to help you like psychologically or whatever. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, yeah, you should go for a walk. That's totally worth the calories because we live in such a convenient world now and everything's so much easier that we have all this food and everything's more plentiful that like, it doesn't really make as much sense to have to worry about all, oh, you know, that's going to use up this much calorie of energy, you know, that's better for hunting or something like that. Because anytime you really have to do something, there's not that, Oh, maybe I shouldn't. There's like, yeah, I got to do it because there's a reason behind it. So having that reason is, is really important. So Eric, that, that makes uh, it's a, it's a really interesting theory that makes a lot of sense, but I do have to ask you this. Did you okay. come up with that theory while you were high or on mushrooms? No, no, I just like thought of it myself. <laughs> just, yeah, I just thought of it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, that, was, that was maybe a little inappropriate of a question, but you know, it's it's okay. It's um, we're we're having a little fun here too. All right, so yeah, exposure yeah, yeah. therapy. That was number one. Number two was was that the number two? Uh, number two is uh, uh self like introspection or whatever, being able to like evil journaling or something like that, and accepting the good and bad about yourself and in acknowledging things that you do that are really bad like even to other people like something yeah. that's like because not everyone's perfectly a, a saint like people have things they did that are really bad that they've done to other people or things they've done in their life but accepting that and actually saying you know what i was a asshole there or i was just a terrible person here and there i did terrible things um and acknowledging that i think is, is a really good step in improvement what what does that do for you? I I agree with you completely. What, what I'm doing that like what is that? How has that helped you? Well, it's helped me to kind of look at it as a bigger picture and kind of separate myself from like this like ego where you don't want to admit I did something wrong or you don't want to admit that I was a bad person here or there, and actually looking at it or like putting it on paper and, and writing it down, and and really just like figuring out, okay what do I actually want because I'm not happy that I did that. I feel bad about I did that. So what can I do to make it so I don't end up doing that again, or I end up being a better person that I want to actually be? And I think that is a, a um, what, what you just described there is a, a wonderful sort of exercise and uh, um, sort of approach for shame resiliency, you know, or it's really focusing mm -hmm. on like, yeah, I, I did that and I'm not proud of that, but you're focusing on the behavior uh, versus the, the, you know, you as a person, you're not saying, well, what kind of person am I? That did that? Like, that's not the type of person I want to be based on those actions. I don't like that. I did that. Um, and I, and I, and I so agree with the idea of, of sharing those kinds of things with, uh, with others. Um, it really is helpful. All right. So that's number two. And it's, it's a good way to notice patterns and stuff too. Um, especially one, one thing in particular I noticed is if it was in with relationships, people tend to end up in the exact same relationship over and over and over and over again with the same person. It's because Amazing. you're not dealing with the actual inner problem. You know, you just keep on thinking, Oh, I feel good when I'm in a relationship it makes me feel better. You're going to keep having the same problem over and over again. Cause you're not dealing with the root cause you attract the certain kind of person because you still have the same problems. What you should do in a relationship is take it as a learning opportunity to learn more about yourself. Cause they could tell you, Hey, you're a dick when you do this, or you're doing this, or, you know, you don't like to get criticized or something and take that as constructive criticism. And then your next relationships will be so much better from there. 
Eric, that's, that's a yeah, that's that's some pretty insightful wisdom there for for a, for a young chap of your age. Uh, no, it's it's you're you're spot on there. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm humble at that too. <laughs> um, well, no, it's just uh, like I like I've just you know done a lot of introspection stuff and kind of I'm like really into philosophy and stuff like that and you know I, I tend to philosophize about a lot of things like that and that's something that I've noticed is that there's there's hidden things that you're not aware of that you do and there's hidden things about your personality that aren't so good and it's that self introspection, even other people telling you either a close friend or something, because as a society, we have this taboo of telling people straight up what's wrong. We don't want to be rude. We don't want to be mean, but it's really important to just tell someone that like the, the truth, you know, if someone stinks to, Hey, you stink. You should probably wear some deodorant or something instead of just like letting them stink. And then they're like, why like, is or, or everybody in the room is thinking it, but nobody is saying it. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's so important to, um, really start, doing that. Cause that's the only way we can do self growth because the thing about, um, feeling comfortable is that comfortability is like, it's like a garden. That's like really beautiful. Like it's just so nice to just be comfortable, but nothing grows there. Like you can't grow in just being comfortable and not doing anything. You have to feel uncomfortable. And the one thing also um, I, I read the book, uh, the simple art of not giving a fuck. I don't know if you heard of it. I have. Yes. I, I love that book. It's a good book. Basically when you live life, you always are going to have problems no matter what you can't get rid of problems. You're always going to have some problem. You're always going to have some negative thing happen. And that's what life is, but it's, it's working towards solving the problems that makes life worth living and makes you happy because people are always looking for happiness, but it's what they're looking for is pleasure, not necessarily happiness. And they mix the two up and, you know, you can't really just, Oh, I'm going to go be happy. It, it's not something you can really do. It's, it's a byproduct. And, um, by, you know, just solving the like problems to get better problems that you prefer dealing with, um, I think is, is, is a huge part of like what I was talking about before with the introspection and stuff and, and really, um, being uncomfortable is what I think will actually make you happier in the end is uh doing what you want taking the risk because i think the one thing i'm don't want to happen in my life is i don't want to be on my deathbed and full of regrets i would rather try something and completely fail than never try it all and always wonder what if it's awesome yeah i mean it's uh yeah so are you gonna become a therapist what's your deal i mean uh <laughs> i don't know because <laughs> I mean, it's true i mean that and something i sometimes wonder um do you think that there's a an element of um, that some of the struggle and the pain that you've been through has sort of helped you um, sort of learn these kinds of things? I think the, the stuff that I went through in that has put things into perspective. Mm. People, I believe we live in a world nowadays where things are so good, but people still complain. You know, back in the day, people used to people used to worry about, you know, eating and surviving, you know, people used to worry about, you know, putting food on the table and stuff like that. Nowadays, people worry about how am I going to be happy? People struggle to be happy back then. They struggle to find food. Right. It's just strange that we live in a world where things are so comfortable and so simple, but we still find things to complain about. Like, Oh, you didn't put whipped cream on my latte or something. You get some person from a foreign country. They're like, Whoa, there's so much sugar in this. This is crazy. <laughs> like this is amazing like like you have a, a, a phone that can communicate with anyone in the entire world that's insane i, I love the phrase first world problems yes for sure for yeah, sure because it's like it's so true too i mean in in my coaching groups we every friday we, we go around and share something that we feel grateful for so it's it's having gratitudes without the butt is the way we do it it's like because it, what will happen is i'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the blah 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 but it's like no, 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 no. like F like put your attention on what you're actually grateful for. So that's what your mind is now looking at and thinking about. Um, and I forget who, who initially, who I first heard say this, but you know, when you're doing sort of uh breath work and we're in thinking about gratitude and like, you know, if you're finding a heart, finding it hard to, to find something to feel grateful for, look for your breath. Cause if you can't find it, you have much bigger problems. I, I always wondered why, I find that people like want to bitch about something. 
like they actually want to. And I, I never really understood why that is. It's either some type of a social thing to talk about with people or something. I'm not too sure, but it tends, especially with like older people, they just, they have nothing better to do. So they just want to bitch about things. It's just really weird that humans do that. You know, I, I, I think that there is a tendency in people to do that, but I also think that groups of people tend to connect with groups of people who do the same kinds of things. So if, so if your experience of, of uh, working with, or just interacting with adults is that, you know, then I certainly can see that way. Cause I, I certainly know people uh, in my own life who uh, <clears throat> that's what they like to do. Um, and I think often don't even realize like how, how much they're doing it and how it, it, it's like, I mean, I personally choose to not be around people um, who do that because it, it impacts me and I, I don't want to go down that negative uh, sort of emotional tailspin. There's a, there's a thing also I want to add is some people purposely try to feel like crap. And what I mean by that is it's comfortable. It's comfortable to be really depressed. It's, it's comfortable. It's the rock bottom is comfortable because there's no more farther down. And you also know it. It's familiar if that's where you've been. So some people, and it's really hard to help people like that, they're stuck in just, they're too scared to not feel, to feel uncomfortable. So they constantly put themselves down and you try to help someone like that. And they're like, oh, but, uh, you know, so you like do something for them and they're like, oh, but this doesn't work because of this. Or they come up with reasons and it's so hard to help someone that doesn't want to be helped. It's really hard. And I'm not sure how you do that, but if you want to be helped and you're willing to do the things, then it's pretty well a guarantee that things will get better for you. It's when you don't want to get help and you don't put the effort in that it never gets better. And you end up, some people live their entire lives miserable because they never try to get better. So Eric, let me ask you this, um, before we hit record. Um, so speaking, speaking of getting help, um, there's a sloppy segue there. Um, so I, I asked you if you would be interested in, in, in sitting in the hot seat and uh, um, letting me sort of coach you through uh, maybe one or two things that's going on with you. And one of the things that you uh, you said, um, issues with hyper-focus and yep. issues with uh, related to, to this kind of social stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the social uh, stuff. Yeah. So if you can pick one, because you didn't add prioritizing decision-making on your list of things that you need help with. So I'm going to let you pick one. <laughs> <laughs> um should have wished for more wishes damn it <laughs> I, th I think the the social one would probably be a bit more so okay all right so um take a few minutes here and share with us what the, what the challenge is and what you're hoping what kind of help you're looking for i find that as i gotten older and stuff it's like when i was younger i was able to like hang out with people all the time and that and now it's, it's very limited and it's more like acquaintances and stuff. And it just feels like there's something missing. Like it doesn't feel right. Um, kind of feel lonely and stuff a lot. Um, and I'm not, it just feels like the society is structured around a family and, and trying to find someone to date and, and marry and have kids with stuff like that. And anything outside that bounds, you end up kind of alone with just acquaintances and stuff. And I'm not too sure what to do about that. Okay. Um, definitely a, uh, a, a issue that I can, um, I personally relate to in the friendship uh, realm and my wife and uh, um, outside of that, it's uh, you know, it's a lot of acquaintances as I think for adults, it's way harder to make friends. You know, it's, it's when you're in school, it's like, you know, it's, you think about sort of the, the weird notion of like when you're in school, especially in younger grades, how the teacher refers to, to everyone as your friends, which, which I actually take issue with for different reasons. Cause it's like, no, like not everyone has to be your friend. So don't call people my friend. Like that person's not my friend. Like they're mean to me when you're not watching, you know? So it's like, so I understand this peers and his friends, but sort of the expectation is you're around, like when you're in school, you are around the same age people uh, up in, and, and the next time that we're going to all be, have this opportunity to be with a whole bunch of same age people is probably when we're in like a home somewhere. Right. Um, which and I hope by that point they make homes fun, you know, and it's like, it's like, you know, college dorms for like, you know, the 70 plus, <laughs> you know, I, th I think that sounds kind of cool. Um, you know, have all this like, you know, service brought to you. It's like, that. I've been waiting my whole life for that. Um, so, okay. What, 
where are you sort of see? You said you're lonely. I think there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Because there's lots of times where I'm alone and I'm very happy with being being alone. But I can't, okay. you can also get lonely as well. And do you do you see a distinction there? Um. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. That wasn't very convincing. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I just have a, I don't know when I'm, it just feels like when I'm alone too much, I start like losing my mind or something. Sure. Sure. It's sort of the echo chamber of your own mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where are, um, so you're, you're in Canada, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where around you are there are places where people gather? I mean, there's like bars and stuff, but I'm not really into that as much. You don't strike me as the bar kind of person. No. Nah. Um, into so, what what are some of your hobbies? I don't know. I like watching movies and stuff, and like going and traveling and um, going for like bike rides and stuff. I like I don't know adventures and crap and doing okay. things. Exciting. So. Um, Movies is a little bit hard because um, by, by the nature, it's sort of, it's like you're kind of a, a dick if you're like talking during a movie. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the traveling, uh, the, the traveling uh, part, there are lots of sort of organized uh, uh, group traveling programs, including those in, in college um, and in the community college that are even non, like non-credit uh, uh, type of activities. Um, so that could be something to explore. Um Group bike rides, I know, are also something that uh, that are that people do. Um, is uh, I know that in in the states we have meetup. Do you have that at uh, where you're at? Um, yeah, I like I like looked at that, but there was nothing really uh, that caught my eye. I guess. Okay. Um, you feel like starting something? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It te- it tends to be like a lot of people I talk to are like through the internet or something. Mm-hmm. Um. I, I, it's hard to find people that kind of fit the same personality type or something. Or- in, you know what I think it is too. I think that that the the thing that I think we often have taken for granted when we were younger is that um, there's a process of building friendships. And first, there's this acquaintanceship, and we and you know most of the people that we became friends with as kids. It was a matter of convenience. Like we became friends with a kid that we were in class with. We became friends with the kid that we did carpool with or were on the baseball team with. Or um, if you were an overweight Jewish kid like myself on the bowling team with. Um, you know, so it's it's looking at what are the activities. So that's sort of like step one to see, okay, what are the activities that I like and that are fun? And knowing that like it may be that it's hard to find someone that you connect with, but you have to start there. Um, and know that, that people that you connect with are out there, it just may be harder to to um, to connect it to. You know, it's sort of that idea of the the, the salesman who um, knows that it's really hard to make a sale, who's going doing door to door sales, um, and knows uh, statistically speaking that after every thirty no's, he gets a yes. So you have to go after the no's, right? And yeah. so it's like you have to keep showing up to increase your oppor- the, the likelihood That's that you're going to find someone that you connect to. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Actually, um, kind of getting out and meeting people and stuff and things kind of just fall into place for sure. I don't know. I guess like friendships are kind of like spotty here and there. Like we'll hang out once in a while or something. Yeah. I mean, do you think uh, that some of the ADHD, um, like factor of like, you know, remembering to call someone back initiating, I I know that that I I struggle with that. Also just the impulsivity, uh, impulsivity or whatever, just, um, saying the wrong thing or just you know it's hard to to go through a conversation too long um and then you're thinking well should i say this i don't know and then you end up saying it it was a bad <laughs> idea and then you're like oh crap. Or you're, you're in your head for like th- a good three minutes about what you should say and then you make the comment and then you're like everyone gives you that look it's like what are you talking yeah. about because that part of the conversation well, moved on three like, minutes great. ago <laughs> Right now, I'm on I'm on too low of a dose of my medication right now. Okay. Um, and um, this Friday I'm supposed to get it raised or whatever. But I know when I'm on a like a larger dose of the medication, it definitely helps socially majorly. Mm. Um, but yeah, right now it's like not strong enough at all. So okay, it helps a bit, but not like enough. Okay, so um, you, you already sounds like you're, you've uh, you're looking at, at uh, one solution that's coming up this week. That's increasing the medication. 
um, sort of identifying, and it seems like when you understand the idea behind something, uh, it, it's easier for you to get the buy into it. So the, the idea that you have to have the buy, you have to understand the why in order to do the what? Can you explain that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so when the, the idea of you have to keep showing up at these different yeah. things in order to increase the likelihood that you're going to find someone that you connect, connect with. So it's like dating. It is like dating. Okay. It is. I, I've talked to so many people who think that there needs to be like, a, you know, like a, a Tinder or a match, like just for friendships, for just like yeah, platonic I don't friendships. Have that for some reason. It, I don't know why there, there isn't. I mean, it's a whole other side tangent that, that my brain's wanting to go down. But the other part of my brain is saying, no, stay, stay over here, stay over here. Don't go down there. So we're going to stay focused. So you're just like swiping, oh, good friend, bad friend, bad friend, good friend. <laughs> <laughs> so like you know gets mad at you for not returning phone calls nope oh. <laughs> they get mad at you it's not gonna be a good friendship here um <laughs> okay so um then looking at it from the strategic stuff so you said you like uh going on bike rides yeah yeah have you tried going to different bike stores and seeing if they if they have organized bike rides no <laughs> would you be willing to try that no okay, tell me why <laughs> I don't know. I just don't really like when I go for a bike ride, like it's like I travel like like I went like really far distances, like about an hour car drive of 100 kilometers. I don't know what that is in miles, but it's a lot scientifically speaking. OK, so I know my my, my father in law is a avid, avid cyclist. Um, okay. you know, he he does his, these uh, um, 10 day, like 1500 mile like excursions that like, people who are like half his age look, look just completely idolize him because he's just like the most in shape person. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, he, he'll he'll be biking for like six, eight hours at a time. It's just like, how the hell do you do it? It's, it really is incredible. Um, the first thing I went for a bike ride with him is like right before I, my wife and I got married. And let me tell you, that was an intimidating bike ride. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. Don't don't make it look like you're gonna die. <laughs> so there are groups that, that do what you're looking for, right? So yeah. it's, it's about looking for and asking people like asking people if they know of other people who might be able to connect you. So there is some sort of research I think involved in that. I think um, a lot of it is getting better at uh, communication as, as if it is like medication helps you or whatever mm -hmm. and just really get putting yourself in uncomfortable situations because I'm not super comfortable in like crowds of people and stuff like that or sometimes meeting new people is kind of intimidating and stuff for me mm -hmm. like the one thing I don't like about uh in like clubs and stuff is like you can't freaking talk like you just like <laughs> You know, yeah. It's like someone said, I, I can't hear anything these people are saying. I don't know what the hell is going on. Right. I mean, I have a hard enough time, like, if I'm in a conversation and I have, and there's like a couple other people talking in the background, like, that's hard, can be hard for me. And so, like, yeah, when it's yeah. at a club, it's just like, why am I here? Right? So I totally get it. Um, yeah, I know. You know and, and think, you know, consider too that like introversion is also, that's, that's not a pathological issue. Like, if being around pe like a large group of people, like is exhausting to you, then like you're probably an introvert, right? And like that's not an that's not a, a problem. It's, it's then identifying like what kinds of social situations do you prefer? Like does it does a a and I think one of the challenges is that I think that often when people with ADHD, I think especially those who are sort of you know, are deep thinkers, and I think that I would say you're a deep thinker, um, we sort of crave that that deep connection, yeah. and when we have to sort of go through this like. This it's it's kind of a game, you know, of like, can I like deal with like the the superficial stuff and to get to like level two, which is like a little bit deeper stuff, you know? It's like, you know, and it's it's often really like can be painful to try to pass level one. It's like I don't care about most of this stuff. It's like how do we find out like who, who you really are and what what are the deep thoughts you think about? Can we just get right to that point? But it's like that's not how it really works, though, unfortunately. I think I think there's like there is people out there that that are the same. It's just not the majority, and so um, th that's the problem with being in a a, a smaller demographic or whatever. Is you got to do that searching, and and sometimes a lot of your friends are going to live cities over or a different state or what have you. Thankfully, we have the internet, so you can at least communicate that way. What about campus groups? Uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about looking into that. I just kind of started college, so I'm just kind of right now. I'm just focused on the work because it's like really intense. Midterms coming up, so mm -hmm. 
But, uh, I, think, I think they'll also probably find, um, I mean, it's, it's amazing how many just uh, student groups there are on, on college campuses. I, I so miss that part of college. Um, and you'll find people who are, I mean, there's probably a philosophy club. I mean, truly, like, there's... Yeah, there is probably. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember being part of a, a uh, when I was my undergrad at, at, a, uh, at Bradley in, uh, in Illinois, there was a group that I was very active in called the Bradley Peace Network. Like, I loved it. Like, we went and protested, like, all these, like, crazy groups. And, like, it was amazing, right? It was like, these are, like, my people who, like, care about issues that are, like, about social justice and, like, you know, standing up to, like, white supremacist groups, like... And that's kind of fun because it was also a little bit dangerous at the same time. Um, and like, I felt like I was doing something good. And, you know, so that, and I, and I did uh, build a lot of friendships that way. There you go. So it's like finding where, the, finding where people who have common interests meet. It's, but take it in a, whatever you currently do that helps you to sort of organize your to-do lists, you know, and those action items, take social and use that same approach, right? Like schedule it. Um, I tried doing something. I tried, I made like this chart where anytime I'd communicate with someone or talk to someone, I would like mark it down. But then I just ended up stopped doing that because mm-hmm. it was really tedious. <laughs> well, and, and, and it probably is tedious, but then you want to sort of ask yourself, okay, so like what is worse? The tedious, the, the, TDM, is that a word? The, 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 the TDM of that. I'm sure the grammar police are going to send me an email. Um, the, the, the TDM of that or the, like the, the pain of you know, not having friends when you, when you really desire them. Uh, I mean, I feel like my brain says one thing and I say another thing. Like, I was talking about something very on, recently, Eric, that was saying something about how it's like the struggle is what helps you grow. And it's not just, I think that was <laughs> you, Eric, now that I think about it. Well, I feel like once I get on the right dose of medication, that'll probably be a lot easier. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Okay. So what, what if you put in your calendar in like two or three weeks from now, so you get your, your medication is now, uh, you're at a, a newer dose and you, you sort of prompt yourself with a question, like, am I now able to, uh, um, you know, is it, can I seek out social uh, relationships now, like with the medication? Because you're basically, you're, 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 you have a hypothesis that being on a medication is going to help you with this, mm-hmm. right? So your hypothesis is now, so in two or three weeks from now, how can you check in with, with that hypothesis? What exactly are you saying? You're saying like... <laughs> You're just like, what the hell did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> are you saying like, kind of like, like when I get to that moment, kind of recap and see yeah. what the... Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so, and, and it can even be... A, so maybe some of the ideas that we talked about here, you know, maybe begin that sort of initiating those ideas in, you know, in a week or two, like after you've started taking the medication, the increased dosage. That's something also is like having goals and stuff and seeing yourself, like actually seeing yourself improve. Cause I find that like, I can't remember what the hell I did or if I did improve. And then you just feel like you haven't been improving. And then, but if you actually keep track of it. Well, Eric, it, are, me too. And like, that's, that's why I have to write everything down. I mean, I, I sort of live by the philosophy that I'm going to rem- like, I'm going to forget. Like if you assume that you're going to have like severe amnesia from every moment, to every moment, but you are like, but you don't want that to be the way things are. Then you learn to develop strategies, and and is it a, it can be can it be a pain to have to write things out all the time? Yes, but I find it more painful not to. Yeah, but if I didn't write things down or have a calendar, I would be completely lost. <laughs> like, it's literally mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it, that is uh, I cannot argue with that at all. Um, are, are there any other um, uh, things that you that you haven't shared that you want, or any other questions that you have for me that I might be able to to help? happy with i i do find like with the hyper focus thing things that are very mentally stimulating i end up getting really into and then hours and hours go by and it's hard to break that i had to get to a point where i did like shut off my internet to be able to do other thing so i don't know that's but. actually that's a brilliant it's a brilliant strategy um i've i've used strategies like that myself um you know doing things like and, and just to be really really a transparent for the listeners um so our, we were scheduled for uh, for 1 p.m. And I typically, I give myself about 10 to 15 minutes ahead of a, uh, a scheduled interview to sort of prep and get all ready for it. And I was working on a, a, a graphic for something I was working on. And I looked at the, the, the clock and I had half an hour and um, said, all right, I'll, I'll work on this for about 10 or 15 more minutes and then I'll transition over. And then it was one o'clock. <laughs> so I... I 
still sometimes struggle with this and, and recognizing what are those specific things that, and definitely like doing any kind of graphic design stuff for me um, is one of those things. So identifying what are those, the things that you have the, a greater propensity to, uh, to get sort of sucked into hyper-focus. Right? Mm-hmm. Have you ever tried something like the Pomodoro technique? I somewhat heard of it, but don't know too, too much. So the idea of it is uh, you set a timer for 25 minutes. Um, when that 25 minutes is up, you, you take a, a, a timed break for five minutes. Now that break can be staring at a wall, going to the bathroom, getting a drink, doing a, a, a little task. It's also productive, like opening mail, stuff like that, right? And then the idea is to, to try to do four cycles of that. Um, and then you take a longer break. And as hard as it can sometimes be to disengage, when we disengage, it sort of allows our our brain to sort of take perspective of that that task that we're working on and then reapproach it in a more fresh uh, perspective. Um, And I know whenever I do it, I see the time we're about to to go off. I'm like, oh, I want to keep going. And it takes a lot of effort to really like, you know, respect the timer, right? But every time I do, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I did that because it really, really was helpful. Because um, after really about 20 to 25 minutes, our attention is is we're not sort of balancing ourselves between big picture and detail. We get really just stuck on detail, right? And so we're just like spent like three hours on this little minute detail, which is really insignificant to the thing that we're working on. Um, so, you know. Using timers that way, using p- placing a timer where you have to actually get up to turn it off. Like if you have that ability, as uh, I do, and many other people that I know uh, who, who are listening to this do, to snooze your alarm or stop it without even realizing that you did it. Um, yeah, that it's it's like magic power we have, right? Um, but it doesn't work. It's not good for us though. Is like move your clock or move the alarm wherever it is, like away from you. Have to actually get up. Um, like I, I have a timer that I use that uh, will will vibrate, um, and if I know that I need to t- stop what I'm doing, I'll take that timer and sort of roll it across my my floor so it's on the wood part of my floor because like vi- a, something that's hard plastic vibrating on floor is really loud and annoying, right? So I'm gonna get up, and sometimes it's just it's breaking that 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 hyper focus by just physically forcing yourself to get up it can be really helpful. You know what I just thought of, which would be a cool idea, is if they invented this watch that shocks you at a certain time. <laughs> they have something like that. It's called a Pavlock. Okay. So it's like a Pavlov, like Pavlock. So you can actually have it administer like small doses of electric shock. They say that it's it's like about equivalent to a like a bee sting. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but like it, it in in. So I'm I'm a mixed thoughts about this. I think in some ways it sort of makes sense and can be effective um, if you have the right kind of mindset. I think that we also know that that when aversive stimuli is used, like basically punishment, uh, is used for a a, a targeted behavior, that n- most people have a tendency to to then sort of um, become more oppositional to that. So it might work in the short term. Um, but I, I really think it depends. It really depends on how you view the stimuli. Like, if you view it more of like a gamification sort of uh, um, sort of stimuli, then it could be effective. But I have had the thought for years for like, getting myself to get into bed um, and turn my you know to, to not be looking at my phone. That it would be really effective. That if I had like you know some kind of electric something <laughs> connected to me, or like as the, the only way I could avoid it from going off and zapping me is I have to be in bed, and it's somehow I know that because it has a small like, like geofence perimeter that's confined to my actual bed, and it will only work if my phone is like not present with me in that geofence. <laughs> so yes, like this is what I thought of as well. So, um, but yes, they do have something like that. I, I I don't know if I think it's a good idea or not. I I think it's it's interesting. Um, I think that probably my my ethics board would probably say do not recommend that as a tool because that's cruel. Um, But it's, uh, you know, I think with informed consent, if you know what you're signing up for, it will be an interesting experiment. Well, there you go. I know you can set it up too where if you you can, on the the web uh, part of it, like you can say if I go on Facebook for like the next like hour, like zap me. (laughs) 
All right. <laughs> Which is crazy, but it might work. I, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like it would just because I wouldn't want to get shocked. So I was like, okay, I better. Right, me neither. <laughs> but then I tried to find ways of like disenabling it or something. Well, right. Then it's just like, well, can you start by just taking it off? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's, like, it's like, oh man, I know, I know I'm going to get zapped. You have to have like a key and then throw the key in a river or something. And then, then you're good. <laughs> yeah, the, the other thing too for, for hyperfocus is if you know you're going to be working on something, um, you know, sh- let somebody know that you're about to be working on something that you might get sort of sucked into and that you want to check in with that person at a designated time. Um, that's where accountability can be really helpful too. Uh, I found I found turning off the internet was good. That that seemed to work. Yeah, it's really difficult though. <laughs> Okay, so um, Eric, any any final thoughts from you? No, I don't think so. Do you want to tell people what your YouTube channel is so they can check it out? Oh, uh, if you just look up Eric Light on YouTube, you should find me. And that's uh, like L I G H T. L I G H T, yeah. And E R I C. You spell it the right way. Nice job. Oh. <laughs> According to Eric dot com, sixty seven percent of all Eric spell it with a C. Oh, well, there you go. And I didn't just make that up. I swear. Um, it really is a website. <laughs> um, okay, well. Eric, thank you so much for for sharing your story. And I know you shared a lot of, of uh, difficult things. I do appreciate you sharing that. And uh, um, you really have some some incredible insights. And uh, you know, keep keep working through the struggle because that's what's going to teach you and and really help you build that wisdom that uh, that clearly you're you're uh, on the track of um, of approaching life in a very sort of uh, eyes wide open, thoughtful approach. Not always easy when you have both eyes open and you see the world as it is. Well, there you go. Well, thank you so much for uh, for spending the That's time fun. with us. That's all we got. You know, sometimes starting is the hardest part, but ending can also be hard too. So let's just end it right here. All right. This has been Eric Tivers, and I want to thank you for listening. And congratulations, you made it to the end. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning growing and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find additional summaries and resources for each episode, learn more about the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group, and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. You want to see interviews with content not heard on the podcast? Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. Don't just be a passive listener. Be an active member of the community. Submit your request to join our free and growing community on Facebook. Watch your message inbox. You will get a message either from myself or Nisha Subramanian. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, and clients. If you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, tell them about this show. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really love this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the word and get this message out there. One of the biggest things that you really can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? You could start with Brene Brown's The Gifts of Imperfections or her six-hour recorded workshop, The Power of Vulnerability. If you've already listened to those, then you might want to move on to Daring Greatly or her most recent book, Rising Strong. This is Eric Tivers, and I want to leave you with a question. Do you stay up late to finish work so you only sleep for five hours and then the next day you have trouble focusing so you stay up late to finish work? If so, you might be in the ADHD productivity sleep cycle. Try this instead. Go to sleep. Get an accountability partner to check in with about your sleep time. Get more sleep. Get more done. 
Thanks for listening. Until next time.